hata juzi mlisikia tukawa na habari pengine kutakuwa na El Nino ambayo itaharibu kule itaharibu mali nyingine lakini Mungu ni nani mmesikia wale watu wamesema tena ile El Nino haitakuweko wamesema kutakuwa tu na mvua kubwa lakini haitafika pale ya kuharibu si tunamshukuru Mungu jameni so na hiyo mvua nyingi ambayo tutapata pia tumejipanga katika hii eh, eh, short rains tumepanga pia wakulima watuzalishie chakula tena so that we have another harvest by january or february na ndio niliwaeleza ya kwamba njia ya kuondoa matatizo ya njaa Kenya sio maandamano na kama ni maandamano ni maandamano shambani All right, the president again on Sunday speaking about the El Nino phenomenon that uh, had been, there was a warning that had been issued by the Kenya Meteorological Department. Um, Deputy Speaker, so you sit at the National Assembly and we understand that uh, there was communication to the tune of about 10 billion shillings being um, rerouted to take care of that emergency. Um, so where are we? Because earlier in the week I hosted one of the members of parliament and he was saying that uh, this was a plot to steal or to embezzle resources uh, of the public. Where are we with this and who should we listen to? The Kenya Met or the president on matters weather? Okay, I think Sam, uh, before I answer that question, which I will, mm -hmm. I think it's important that something that has been said by Senator Kajuang uh, uh, casting aspersions on the person of the Speaker of the National Assembly and the National Assembly as a whole cannot go un un unrebutted. So just allow me to bring his attention because he has uh, uh, Im uh, imputed sinister motive on the part of the Speaker uh, as it regards to the Sabina Chege uh, uh, Removal. Uh, mm. uh, no, uh, ruling. Mm -hmm. there was a, and he says, and his question was, what new information came to the Speaker? for him to make this ruling. This matter has been ongoing, and I will just bring, a, I, I will leave you with a copy of this ruling, because I think it's lack of professional courtesy to be to cast as passions on, uh, on the Speaker of Parliament. I would never do that. I would never sit on a television station and cast as passions on the Speaker of Senate. And remember, he is a member of Parliament. Mm -hmm. Senate and, and the National Assembly constitutes Parliament. If you look at this, it has been a long-standing history. There was a court case. The speaker could not make a decision. Eventually, when the court case, when the, the court made its orders, basically, it sent back the parties to seek, appro to appro to seek appropriate, uh, an appropriate forum for further orders, which meant that they had to go to dispute resolution mechanisms uh, under the Political Parties Act. But just when that was about to happen, again, the speaker's hands were tied because they were not sent to parliament, they were sent to the political parties, dispute resolution. When that happened, immediately there came another request before the speaker mm -hmm. where they were, um, they, that was be, the Jubilee was seeking to be recognized as a parliamentary party. That was in May, 4th of May, 2023. Mm -hmm. Thereafter again, in May 2020, uh, I mean in uh, September, 21st, there had been another letter similar to that written by Jeremiah Kweoni. There was a contradiction by Kanini Kega. And the speaker has gone through the entire chronological set of events that has gone on to this point where now there was some sense of clarity that he could make a ruling. So before that, he could not make a ruling. Thereafter, again, there was uh, the, the, the Jubilee Party continued seeking to be recognized as a parliamentary party. Eventually, they came up. Uh, with a list of 28 members surpassing the threshold of 18 members. Again, the speaker explains that in his, uh, in his ruling. He goes on to say that he later received further communication terminating the membership of uh, Kanini Kega and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Sabina. It, he went on to explain about people's rights to right. association. Mm -hmm. He talks about the communication and the signatures put there by members of the Jubil of Jubilee Party that now eventually culminated in him reaching a decision, a decision. To, to make this decision at this point. So there was nothing sinister about it. It would have been premature 
uh, for the speaker to make a ruling before all, right. all these items have in fact happened. Okay. In fact, the first time, they, if you want, and um, it's just that it will take too much time to go through this, but if you read this, is a very well written speaker, I mean, re, uh, ruling of the speaker. It goes on to even refer to precedent, which was set during the time of the speaker Marende, all right. and then also looking at the doctrine of necessity, where it is important that the work of the parliamentary business should be able to continue. Uh, okay. So with that, I am handing over this particular copy of the ruling to Senator Kajuang so that he can well, educate I, himself I did, on I it. I didn't really need it, but I'll just take it out. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's move to the question about the reins. Who should and and while, uh, while, I'm on, while I'm on that also, mm. because I, I also didn't get a chance to respond to him, I'm also asking Senator Kajuang to be able to go to Homer Bay County. If you remember very clearly, the president mm. and his governor, Wanga, uh, launched the affordable housing project, which is being funded okay. by uh, investors, international uh, investors from different places, who have actually who have had have the confidence in the country to be able to put up those houses. All the government is doing is guaranteeing the uptake upon completion, and in fact, it must be on the fourth or fifth floor by now. Oh, all right. Because the last let time we checked, it was on the is, third floor. You made your point. Yes. Yeah, so I just want. Let, no, we I, I, we have a responsibility here yes. not to allow us to use the airwaves, which is public resources. Yes. To to. Uh, Am to I mislead not the public. To my opinion, uh, Deputy now Speaker, you're entitled, Deputy yes. Speaker, you've made your point. Now yes, answer thank me. You. What should Kenyans? Who should Kenyans listen to? The president or the Kenya Meteorological Department? And mm -hmm. what happens to the billions that were told that were going to be set aside to respond to the emergency? Yes, uh, we all know that it was public knowledge that there was announcements uh, that there is going to be El Nino. And uh, like any responsible country, when that announcement is made by no less than the Meteorological Department. Many counties included uh, got, uh, got involved in preparing mm -hmm. for, for the El Nino rains. Uh, and uh, I think it was a responsible thing to do. Funds were kept aside for it. Uh, you know, it's great that at least we're not going to have uh, El Nino now, they say, because now this has been, uh, has been announced by the World Meteorological Organization. And in fact, we are on the 26th of October, which was the dates that were predicted that the rains would come. And now that we have new scientific information, again, we shall heed to it. I, I think what we should do as a parliament is now to be to ensure, and I, I, will, I think that's the responsibility of the Public Accounts Committee, mm -hmm. to ensure that that money that had been set aside uh, for, for, for uh, mitigating the damage or the consequences of El Nino right. can now be used uh, reapplied elsewhere and to ensure that it doesn't get misused. Okay. That is our responsibility. Senator, is there an anomaly here? Um, the warning is given by the Kenya Met, but it's lifted by the president. What is going on? Well, you would argue the president is a chief executive officer, and so he would uh, have an understanding of everything that goes on in government. But the reason why he's got a cabinet and uh, principal secretaries and various departments is for them to specialize and to focus on their core and narrow mandates. Mm -hmm. The Kenya Met Department, we must support it. Again, because uh, parliament is involved in allocation of resources, parliament is involved in budgeting, I think we must take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Early warning systems. I remember the Secretary General of the United Nations when he came to Kenya for the Africa Climate Summit. In his speech, he said every citizen on earth must have access to early warning systems. Because once you've got access to early warning systems, you can take measures. Kenya is always being caught flat-footed. If it is not misinformation on El Nino, uh, the next couple of months you'll hear there are locusts mm -hmm. coming from Yemen. Uh, it, that happens every other year. It's either floods or locusts or a drought because we don't invest in early warning systems. To date, globally, one of the biggest consumers of microprocessors mm -hmm. and semiconductors in the world are those people involved in weather forecasting. When you start up your phone, be it Android or iPhone, you'll be able to see the weather forecast in different uh, parts of the world. If it's an iPhone, it'll be tell telling you about the weather in Capitino. I don't know whether, where that Capitino is. Uh, if it's Android, it will probably tell you about the weather somewhere else. 
the world is moving towards harnessing data, huge volumes of data, and applying very powerful uh, uh, processors and semiconductors mm -hmm. to be able to forecast what the weather will be like in the next five minutes, in the next one hour, in the next couple of weeks. When you are traveling outside the country, I'm sure you, you'll always be checking how the weather will be like. So these things are not rocket science. Okay. What we need to do is, as a government, and I started by saying we must be intentional about everything. We must be intentional about Kenya also being a leader when it comes to innovation. I like what the uh, British are saying. Rishi Sunak is saying that he wants Britain, the great Britain, to be the greatest country when it comes to innovation. And you can see it, the manner in which they fund their universities. Great Britain is the home of Oxford, Cambridge. What about Kenya? Kenya was the home of the University of Nairobi, the University of Nairobi. Today, you find parents preferring to send their children to Makerere across to Tanzania because of the funding and because of the financing obstacles they face in Kenya. You cannot be a leader in innovation mm. if you do not support the institutions that give birth and that catalyze that innovation. That is our universities, and that is research institutes, and that is uh, institutes like Kenya Met. I, I, I don't want to talk too much about the anticipated uh, uh, windfall from the El Nino funds. Thank God that the El Nino didn't come because the last time it came, there was loss of lives. There was pilferage of public funds. It's a good thing that we're going to have uh, heavy rains. That is going to spur agricultural productivity. Mm -hmm. Finally, Sam, it is unfortunate. Our agricultural sector is on autopilot. I listened to my colleague and friend talk about some of the interventions that the government is putting to spur agriculture. We have this obsession with fertilizer. If you read the report that came from Tegemeo Institute, uh, from Egerton University, about the impact of the agriculture subsidy, it, it, it ended up benefiting farmers in a few counties, and namely was in Gishu and Transoya, and those are not my words, those are uh, you know, a, a renowned think tank. Mm -hmm. The report concludes that those who benefited were large-scale farmers at the expense of the small-scale farmers. The report concludes that as a result of government's deliberate uh, effort to lower the price of fertilizer, it killed an entire value chain that already existed in terms of people who are distributing, retailing, and, and, and preparing uh, fertilizer. So sometimes some of the- uh, Does it talk of small-scale farmers that went to pick or to seek the fertilizer and then they didn't get? Uh, perhaps I didn't see that uh, particular aspect, but for me, those are the three things that stood out. That okay. uh, Transoya was in Gishu are the biggest beneficiaries. The big scale farmers uh, uh, benefited at the expense of the small scale farmers, and it destroyed an entire value chain of those who were involved in that particular sector okay. of agriculture. I, I have to so, say, so, yeah. so, 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 so maybe just to conclude is that yep. the rains will come, uh, we shall have a good harvest, not because of government's effort, okay. because of God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want us to transition and talk about another matter that is uh, active in Parliament, and that is the Haiti mission, because on the 2nd of October 2023, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution allowing Kenya to lead a mission, international mission, uh, security support mission to Haiti. Listen to what transpired uh, yesterday in Parliament. I've got no capacity as a house to authorize or purport to authorize the National Police Service, which is not a security force, as contemplated under the Constitution. So I want to plead with you, before the matter is seized, is seized of by the committees, the other committees, that you do reconsider the message and come back with a considered ruling on the matter I am raising, because it is of immense public interest this House can only act in accordance with the Constitution. And the committee, as you have directed, should be able to consider it and answer those pertinent questions, top among them for me, Honorable Speaker. We never appropriated any resources to deploy forces outside of this country other than what we approved for the Kenya Defense Forces in the DRC. Therefore, if you are deploying our police service to Haiti, who is going to pay for the bill? I am waiting for the committee to deal with that question and tell us whether we need to appropriate more resources or whether someone else is paying because if it is a UN mission, then the rest of the world should be able to pay for our servicemen. 
Okay, so there is communication that uh, the joint uh, committees of the Senate and the National Assembly on Security, they have to process uh, that application and report to the House by the 8th of November. But Deputy Speaker, because you're part of the leadership of the House, um, is this how things are supposed to work? That you first begin, the President speaks about we will send the police to Haiti, the Foreign Affairs Minister says as much, the United Nations passes a resolution, then you come back to seek approval from Kenya. In the first place, do you have um, a way of Parliament making this decision? Okay, again, uh, we'll get, uh, Sam, before I, I answer your question, it's important again to clear certain things that were not said correctly. When you played the clip, because he has said that the President has lifted the order of that there'll be a Nino. You use the word lifted. That is not correct. If you play the clip that you played, the president was actually quoting mm -hmm. the, the Kenya Meteorological Department. So he did not lift it. He, said he quoted Sema. them. Yes, because they have now new information. Mm -hmm. And that was reclarified again by the Kenya Met uh, uh, Department. Mm -hmm. So I think let's be ca careful what we tell people here. The other issue is about fertilizer. The fertilizer, to say that the fertilizer was given to big farmers, that is inaccurate. First of all, when the first subsidized fertilizer was given was to areas that had the short trains. Because at that time, uh, places like Wasingishu, which, which uh, didn't, don't have short trains, mm -hmm. we only have one planting season, they got it. And most of it was Western Kenya. And I can, it's just a pity that I don't have the, the details with me here, but there was a list of 22 counties that did get the, f the first fertilizer. And how you get the fertilizer, I also have it on my phone. They simply, you register through your chief. Okay. And once you, once you register through your chief, you get a message on your phone and they will tell you you've been allocated so many. Mm. What happens is you pay by, uh, by mobile money and then you can go and collect it at any time when you've got it. Okay. And it's given to you in accordance to how many acres of land that you have. All right. So I know people who had half an acre, who had one acre, who are able to go and collect fertilizer. Believe me, the biggest testimony and the facts and figures, I'm actually going to send it to you so that you can post it, or maybe we should have an advert run in the newspaper so that people can see it. Because I think it's just wrong that we actually come here and then mislead Kenya. Oh, right. Now let's speaker, talk I, I about he, the... He said he read the Takemeo report, which I have to say he have not uh, accessed it. I haven't uh, read. Takemeo is funded by the government. But it's we, we wait to see it. It's an um, Egerton University think tank. Okay, so you, you just carry on on the specific question on whether um, the things are running the way they should in this hate emission processing. On this hate emission, uh, if you look at the standing orders, where there's a bilateral agreement and so on, that ca uh, it says that we can, if we get into an agreement with a certain country or countries, we can be able to send our police uh, force to be able to support them. It's clearly stated there. And this is what has happened in this case. It has now come before parliament so that it, and go to the relevant committee to be able to deliberate on it. And when the, that committee is completed with it, it will come to the full um, to the full house. And so I probably will be sitting on the chair then, so I don't want to just uh, talk about it now, but, but it's following its th th That's process. fine, but let's talk about what we can prove because the National Police Service Act, I, I hope that's the name of the act, but the, the act that talks about um, sending police officers talks about uh, a reciprocating government. Yes. In this case, Haiti does not have a reciprocating government or rather has not been identified by the government of Kenya as a, as a reciprocating government. So are we engaging in an illegality and now using parliament to clear it or what's going on? Yeah, and remember also that uh, Kenya is not the only country that is sending its forces. This is a UN-led forces. It's not the first time Kenya has sent uh, its forces. They've done so in Liberia. They've done, when Liberia didn't even have a government. They've done so in uh, Congo. They have done so in um, Sierra Leone uh, and many other places. Which year was that, Deputy Speaker? Yeah, I don't have the exact years now, but if you give me a minute, I can be able to search it. Okay, I'm asking that because we have now a constitution of 2010, and it talks about deployment. It was under, of, the, it was under, the, it was under the new constitution. So deployment uh, of the Kenya Defence Forces under the constitution is, what provi is provided for. The constitution does not talk about deployment of police okay. officers. I'll, I'll, I'll get you the section in a minute. Okay. Uh, Senator, tell me, um, so what is parliament to do? Because the joint committees, Senate and the National Assembly, will process this. So on what basis? And he'll have a chance to raise his issues relating to it. Then. Well, I, 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 yeah. you see, uh, I wonder where, in which baraza, that uh, the president sat down with Kenyans 
and Kenyans told them, told him that we are now sorted out in security in Baringo, now send our boys to Haiti. You just reported today in your news uh, the deaths of people in Baringo, and next week there'll be national examinations in Baringo in Kenya. I told you you can't go to Turkana without having the army to escort you through Kainuk. You've had the things of uh, improvised uh, explosions in places like Mandera, in places like Lamu. Some, just this week, just yesterday, a young boy from my village who had joined the Kenya Defense Forces was brought back in a casket because he was in a sentry box somewhere and uh, they were shot at in Kenya. I wonder when uh, Kenyans told the presidency that we have sorted out our food problems, our un unemployment problems. Now you can go and sort out the problems in Haiti. And the fact is, this is not a UN-led mission. It is a UN-sanctioned mission. The UN, this is not like UNAMIS or the previous UN mission that was in Haiti. The last UN mission that was in Haiti withdrew in failure and in shame and was accused of gross violation of, 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 of human rights. Mm -hmm. For a long time, after the UN made a resolution that uh, there was need to assist the people of Haiti, there was no country that came forward to provide that leadership. China, Russia, the United States of America, Great Britain, France, Italy, all those countries that are big superpowers were unwilling to go to Haiti. The president went to the US and came up with the idea of Kenya leading the mission in Haiti. You see, there are two sets of policies that a government should be known for. And I started this conversation by saying, let's discuss policy and not just politics. There's foreign policy and domestic policy. Domestic policy are the issues of food, issues of taxes, issues of uh, monetary policies that we've already talked about. But foreign policy then can either expose a country or it can strengthen a country's standing. Mm -hmm. There are about four instances that have happened in just in one year since William Ruto got to office. Number one was our position on Sudan. We went to Sudan thinking that uh, we, because we were the new boys, uh, uh, kids on the block, we could uh, mediate. We were chased away from Sudan. And yet in the past, Kenya was seen to be the neutral arbiter in conflict within Africa. Then Israel and Pakistan happened. Instead of posing to interrogate the facts, we were among the first countries to put out a statement that parroted the position of the United States and that was at variance with the position of the African Union. Then there's this Haiti debacle. There's even another element when it comes to climate policy. Climate policy, we had a fairly successful summit here in Nairobi, but a lot of African countries and developed countries were uneasy with the conversations in Nairobi because the conversations in Nairobi were driving Africa towards um, you know, uh, mitigation uh, rather than adaptation. It was driving Africa towards restructuring of the climate financing infrastructure, yet Africa and China and the G77 have worked so hard to have the loss and damage fund to be recognized at uh, the multilateral level mm -hmm. when it comes to financing uh, of, 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 of climate impacts. So we, we are seeing that we don't have a coherent foreign policy and whereas we can make very good speeches on international platform, the content of those speeches mm -hmm. leave us to be laughed at by our neighbors mm -hmm. and leave us appearing as being too keen okay. to please the United States of America. It makes us look like lapdogs of the United States of America. You think that's what this is about? I think this is what it is all about. And unfortunately, the US is going into elections. We don't know what the outcome of the elections will be. Democrats, Republicans have different outlooks okay. when it comes to relationships with Africa. Mm. And so some, for me to summarize, this Haiti mission is a misadventure. We are sending our boys and girls to be killed. They'll come back in caskets. And uh, I hope that the various committees of parliament will turn this down. But I also hope that the matter that has been filed in court by Ekru or court will be given the due consideration and that the courts will pronounce itself that this is an illegality. You okay. cannot commit and then come back to try and rubber stamp that commitment.
Deputy Speaker, you are looking for something. Yes, uh, yes. So I, I didn't find the exact years, mm -hmm. but uh, Kenya has been involved in this type of UN missions before. Like I said, in Liberia, in Somalia, in DRC Congo, it has been done. In fact, when you look at the missions that they've been involved in before, they were much bigger than the one that is going on now. Uh, Haiti is the size of Kitui. And uh, I mean, and they, they, in other places, they were actually going to disarm an entire, you know, sitting, I mean, a, a much bigger country. Um, I think when we speak about this, when you say that the international community has been uneasy about the pronouncement during the climate summit, we know very well that when the international community is uneasy about something, they make it through formal communique mm -hmm. and pronouncements. I want you to set out which formal communique. So it's not your own speculation. It is actual factual communique that was made by those countries. You're not going to be able to give me that. So it's, that's the only way it's demonstrated. Again, um, Sam, when we talk about, you said that it's illegal. You, I would like you I, to- I asked a question because the you, constitution provides for deployment of the Kenya Defense Forces. Yes, the and then the, Act, yes. the National Police Service Act- Says where there is an, an, an bilateral ag agreement. Reciprocating government. Yes. So, it says that, yeah. and then thereafter, it has to come to government, to, uh, to parliament for approval. It is now within parliament. Even going to court is premature. It's what we call, there's no cause of action yet mm -hmm. that has come up for one to be able to go to court. You should let all the motions proceed so that you can come and be able to cite in court and say, this particular section of the law has been contravened that in considering it, Parliament did not look into the following uh, aspects which are required by law, again, so to show the law has been contravened. And then in, the, in uh, considering it at plenary, again, pick out that. But right now you go to court to say what? Because the matter has not reached completion. Again, this is how the court process are being abused. Mm -hmm. People are just going to court so that they can they can put themselves on the headlines or just to be able to, to build their names to show that they, are going, that they are taking on the government. But it is important that you let the process complete. Mm -hmm. And I think the courts sometimes have pronounced themselves on this, where they said, let us allow the process to reach conclusion. Okay. Again, this is a, it's a, the way it was, it was passed to a UN resolution. The, 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 the president is well within the law in the manner in which he's conducted it, and in fact, in the communication that has come to the House and it has been marked to a committee. So let us wait for it to reach at that point. Um, I, I think, and that's why I said to myself, I will wait for the matter to come before the House. Okay. Because now, pronouncing yourself is even preempting the matter. Be no, no, th th that is true, the uh, Deputy Speaker. But there's something you've said that uh, leaves me no chance but to follow mm -hmm. up. Because uh, Section 108 of the National Police Service Act talks about the President may, on the application of the government of a reciprocating country, order such number of police officers as the President may think fit to proceed to that country for service therein for the purpose of assisting the police service of that country in a temporary emergency. Yes. And I would imagine that's one of the clauses that um, uh, the president or the government of Kenya may rely on. But you see, it talks about on the request of a reciprocating government. Yes. I, are we certain <laughs> that the government of Haiti has written to the government of Kenya re requesting for this, but also there is a procedure of how you recognize a government to be recipro reciprocal. And that is why, Sam, I'm saying, yeah. even you, do not know for a fact whether that communication came or not and in which form it came. Mm -hmm. That is why it, the parliamentary committee to, or, uh, upon which it is incumbent to interrogate this mm -hmm. will be looking at that. So right now you're speculating that it doesn't exist. No, I'm not speculating. But I'm telling, asking you a question. No, but I'm asking you, do you have all the communication relating to this matter? Do you have all the minutes of the National Security Council in the, the, when the decision was being made? No, neither do I. The only way we shall know about it, and that is why there is a parliamentary process, mm -hmm. is when the, that is how the matters come before the public. So why should we start casting, casting aspersions now mm -hmm. when those matters haven't come? I think once it's before the committee, these matters are public. Your, the citizen uh, does have Royal Media Group does have a, a correspondence in the parliamentary media center, and therefore they will be in the committee meeting. Right. They will be able to look at the reports. Then at that stage, let's talk about it. Because unlike you, uh, I cannot 
begin to say that communication doesn't exist, yet it is not a fact within my knowledge. Okay. Maybe you have magical powers <laughs> to know what is on the president's Don't go desk. There, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> yes, I think you We're do. We're having a conversation. Yes. And you've been very but eloquent. you have imagined. You, you have, have been you have very imagined. eloquent on other matters. Uh, but it's okay. I take note that you said that you also don't have that communication. And neither do you. Well, do you? Maybe you do. I'd love to get it. Speaker, I'm just summarizing what you've said. <laughs> <laughs> but you can give me. I'd be happy to see it. Then I can quickly make an assessment for you. All right, Deputy yes. Speaker, I hear you. <laughs> Senator, I, I don't want us to leave without talking about what just happened last week because um, it was at the launch of the Community Health Promoters, the Universal Health um, Coverage Program by the government, but also coming to effect of uh, some four health laws that were uh, tackled by the uh, National Assembly and the Senate. Moving forward, the President has spoken about the contributory rate of 2.75%. You look at the acts, it doesn't exist. You look for regulations that don't exist. What are we dealing with here? W the, the challenge we had at independence, again, has not changed. It was poverty, illiteracy, and disease. And those are still the threats that we are dealing with today. We had a view, and uh, in one of the bills that came before the Senate, when we were sitting in Turkana, we made uh, significant amendments to ensure that it did not claw back on devolution and take away the role of county governments. And I'm glad that the National Assembly passed uh, the bill in amended form as it came from the Senate. If we can find a way, an intergovernmental arrangement for us to tackle the disease uh, problem, uh, it, it is welcome. The reason why counties had failed for the last 10 years mm -hmm. to ensure that they have more positive health outcomes and indicators was because of inadequate funding. And you could see that the Ministry of Health budget at the national level was so humongous compared to what was going to county governments, mm -hmm. and yet primary health care was devolved. Even the human resource that is attached to uh, delivery of that service was devolved. We have been saying that County governments and national government need to have an intergovernmental agreement uh, that is supported by Article 187 of the Constitution that then allows them to partner in delivery or provision of primary health care to the citizens. Of course, even if uh, President William Ruto was the one championing it, mm -hmm. the Constitution says that responsibility for that function still remains with the level of government to which it has been assigned by the Constitution. And I'm hoping that progressively, in this uh, intergovernmental uh, agreement, mm -hmm. county governments are going to have more space to execute because in that principle of subsidiarity, we must encourage delivery at the lowest level possible. There are additional costs that would come. There are about three funds that have been established by the Social Health uh, Insurance uh, Act right. uh, away from the one fund. We must also be careful that we do not bring in too many layers of bureaucracy. And you see, for bureaucracy, every other institution that we set up, every other fund that we set up, 30% automatically goes toward management expenses and administration of those funds, instead of it going towards acquisition of drugs. I thought there was a limit of 5%, at least for the authority. Uh, well, well, the practice, the practice, and, and I sit in the Public Accounts Committee, and the practice in government that the least that you're going to spend on management, administration, and T's and mandazis on average is 30%. In many cases, it goes up to 60 or 70%. So then you move away from the core mandate, mm -hmm. and then your existence or survival becomes your core business. Some, I think, uh, uh, for me, it would be a little bit premature to cast aspersions on this plan. Because if disease was a problem that we faced at, at independence, and we still face it today, I do not want to be academic and say that that mandate must purely and solely be left to county governments. Mm -hmm. I want county governments to work with the national government to find a solution that will ensure that every Kenyan has access to health. This increased cost of living. You can imagine that most pharmaceuticals are imported and we buy them in dollars. If a certain drug was one dollar last year, perhaps it was 120 shillings. Mm -hmm. Today it is 157 shillings. Mm -hmm. So it has a huge implication. There are so many Kenyans who will die simply because of those increases. And, and that's why we must have that concerted effort to ensure that every Kenyan does, uh, has access to affordable health. Every Kenyan 
has access to some insurance uh, arrangement right. that uh, then they don't have to sell their family land or they don't have to sell their property to get access to health. I, on this, I want to give the benefit of doubt, but I just, as a senator, uh, and, and, and who's entrusted with protecting and defending devolution, I'm going to encourage the governors that we must have clearly delineated roles through an intergovernmental agreement to okay. deliver that. Deputy Speaker, Kenyans are still coming to terms with the content of the laws. I mean, we've done several stories here to indicate what that exactly means, but it's still work in progress. Then the president comes up with a figure that we don't find anywhere else. Mm, is this starting a conversation early ahead of the regulations and what should we do with that information? Um, I, 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 I think uh, what this, pro, I'm, and I'm, I'm happy that uh, Senator Kajuang does, is actually supports this, uh, the health bills that have come through. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's great progress since the coming into force of our current constitution. Because as you know, Article 43 clearly says that uh, every person has a right to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes healthcare services and so on. Mm -hmm. And it also talks about adequate uh, and accessible housing and reasonable standards of sanitation, mm -hmm. hence the housing. So you can see that all these programs is actually under the social economic rights that are provided for in our constitution. Uh, to provide this healthcare is gonna cost money. It, right. uh, the, the, it won't fall from the sky. So the, uh, currently we pay for the National Health Insur the National NHF. Hospital Insurance Fund, mm. NHIF, has actually been uh, from deductions, has been run based on deductions from persons on, uh, who are employed. Same thing will happen with this. The figures I think are, uh, are currently being looked into because it, it, it uh, takes actuarial scientists to look at it and be able to see how to come up with the correct figure. So I do not have the exact figures now because that hasn't uh, come to the, the, us. The reason I'm asking but definitely, question. definitely we will, just Deputy the way Speaker. we are paying for NHIF, they, we will pay for this. Deputy Speaker, the reason I'm asking this question, once upon a time there was a housing levy of 3% that was capped at 5,000 shillings, uh, being split between the employer and the employee. Then, of course, public participation happened and it came, in a, it came back as a different child, 1.5% with no cap. The president is speaking about 2.75%. He doesn't say there's a cap or there's no cap. Some members of parliament are saying there will be a cap, but you don't have the regulations. What are we supposed to do with this information? That's what I'm asking. Currently, the acts of parliament have, have already been uh, accent, uh, uh, assented to mm -hmm. by the president. Mm -hmm. And you know that the act of parliament just provides the policy. The details are usually in the regulations. Mm -hmm. The regulations haven't been developed yet. It is the ministry that develops the regulation after public participation. So I know that right now they should be starting the process of developing the regulations and they will go through public participation those regulations again as statutory instruments would have to come to the national assembly uh, statutory instruments i mean a committee on delegated legislation which will review it and also undertake public participation but also ensure that it's within the constitution and the laws of kenya and it will also look that there has been an economic assessment done economic uh, impact assessment and a social impact as mentioned to the people. So there is various steps that, uh, that, that are in process. So yes, there's going to be regulations. The president doesn't assent to regulations. He only assents to the actual act of parliament. And when he speaks about a figure that does not exist, and uh, regulations that are not existent? I don't hold brief from the president. You're the one who's informing me <laughs> about the 2.7%. I, I, uh, <laughs> I am informing, usually I, I can speak to things that I know and are within my knowledge, okay. and I don't shy from doing that. On this one, I know as a legislator and as a lawyer mm -hmm. that once there is an act of parliament, okay. then regulations are there developed. And, regu and the, uh, the regulation-making authority mm -hmm. has, been, um, ha has, been, uh, has been delegated by parliament to various institutions and various ministries. But in order for parliament to remain having an oversight over that is the reason why all delegated legislation or okay. all regulations published by the... By the, by the minister or the, very, uh, the, the state corporations or institutions are required to be submitted to parliament okay. within seven days and parliament has 28 days 
within which to approve okay. or nullify those regulations. So again, like I said, it's premature. Right. We are speculating. Let us wait for the regulations. The regulations will definitely set out the mode of payment, the amount of payment, and so on. For clarity, I want to play you the clip of the president because this is not my information. And you said yes. that I'm informing you. Let's listen to No, no, the but even, even if you play the clip, it's it. the same as you telling no, me. No, no, no. I would have to find out where he got those figures. Okay. I'm no, not the head of state. Kufikia January, sasa tutaanza program, kila mtu apate card ya hospitali. Hii mnanelewa? Kila mtu apate card ya hospitali. Either utakuwa umelipia shilingi miatatu, ama serikali itakuwa imekulipia, ama kama mimi na hawa wadosi hawa, malipo yetu itakuwa juu kidogo. Na tujasema yende juu sana apana, tulipe to the same percentage. Mamamboga yaga ni 2.7%. Atamimi, 2.7%. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Let's yes. take a look at the feedback that has come to us. Um, uh, Citizen TV Kenya, Atangituku, the hashtag to use is tonight. Um, so, Norm Kenya is saying that why is the government granting uptake of the affordable housing other than creating, rather than creating an, an enabling environment for developers and the people and let them be? Or is there something the government is guarding? Okay. It's Evans. The argument that the housing fund was to create employment is very pedestrian. We didn't have a um, housing crisis. What is the longevity of AH as a source of employment or that is affordable housing? When we are done with building the, these houses, uh, where will these jobs go? Okay. Okay, Lomolim, you're saying that the problem with our parliament is that the majority of MPs are either unaware of their roles or aren't concerned about the plight of poor Kenyans. Why should MPs visit state house and miss parliamentary sittings for development reasons? Why, it, while it's within their mandate to pass uh, the budget? Uh, These are just some of the views. Um, I have just 30 seconds for each of you to make your closing remarks, starting with you, Deputy Speaker. Yes, I think on the issue of affordable housing, uh, it's. I think that maybe didn't come out clearly. Mm -hmm. It's actually private investors who are the ones who are building the houses. It's not government. Okay. Uh, Senator, your closing remark. I've been away for a while. <laughs> and uh, you see, it, it, it was um, deliberate because we were giving this government that benefit of doubt. We thought that they knew what to do. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it has turned out that they're experts in politics and are clueless when it comes to policy. One year down the line, 20% of time is up and Kenyans are where they are, um, to Wombe. Okay. Senator Moses Kajong from Wombe County, Deputy Speaker uh, at the National Assembly, Gladys Boss. Thank you both for making time for us of this conversation on tonight. Thank you also for your feedback, the many comments and uh, views that you've shared with us. I'll be sure to consume them. My name is Sam Gituku. This has been Tonight. See you again some other time. Good night. <laughs>